This stone tablet shocked the whole archaeology field. Discovered in the Middle East, it dates back to about the third decade of our era, which is basically the New Testament era. And among the inscriptions written there, a very famous biblical name appears, Pontius Pilate. That very same Roman prefect of Judea who, according to the New Testament, sent Jesus Christ to the cross. The tablet proved even to skeptics that Pontius Pilate was absolutely real and the Bible didn't lie. But what about the events described in the most essential part of the Old Testament, Genesis? Will they stand the archaeological and scientific tests? In this video, you'll find out what could have been the prototype for the Garden of Eden. How high did the actual Tower of Babel reach? Could Noah's Ark actually withstand a real flood? And finally, among all the things described in the book of Genesis, what might have happened in real life? The first chapters of Genesis tell us about the creation of the world and the first humans. In the beginning, the universe was very dark, and only then God said, let there be light. And in 1964, physicists Robert Wilson and Arno Penzias managed to find that light using an ultra-sensitive microwave Holmdel horn antenna in New Jersey. They noticed a background noise coming from all directions simultaneously. Today, this phenomenon is known as the cosmic microwave background, and cosmologists are sure this is the very first light in the universe, emitted by hydrogen atoms just 380,000 years after the Big Bang. Until then, there was indeed total darkness everywhere. Still, the rest of the biblical story of the seven-day world creation isn't scientifically proven at all, just a miracle. However, the famous sci-fi writer and atheist Isaac Asimov, in his Guide to the Bible, urged us not to judge the authors of the book of Genesis harshly. In his opinion, they'd gathered the best information on cosmology at the time, and given that the cause of the Big Bang is still unknown, we're not really far away from them. It seems that without some kind of miracle, our universe should not exist at all. Since it makes no sense to search for scientific proof in miracles, and it's generally a matter of faith, let's focus on the most intriguing details that can somehow be verified. For example, where exactly did the first people live? The book of Genesis mentions the four tributaries of the river Eden that wash Adam and Eve's garden of the same name. These are the mysterious Pishon, Gihon, and well-known Tigris and Euphrates. And indeed, the Near Eastern region of Mesopotamia is the cradle of modern civilization because it was there that the first Sumerian cities were built. But where did we overlook Pishon and Gihon? Some medieval theologians speculated that it might have been the Indian Ganges and the Egyptian Nile. But then, the Garden of Eden would occupy an area comparable to the size of Alexander the Great's empire. Yet it still doesn't include the region pointed out by modern anthropologists. These caves are located in South Africa, 50 kilometers from Johannesburg. And there, scientists discovered many scattered remains belonging to the ancient ancestors of Homo sapiens. The earliest date back more than three and a half million years. That's why the caves were called the Cradle of Humankind. Of course, all of this contradicts the Bible, not only geographically, but also ideologically, because scripture states that humans have nothing in common with apes. But what about the origin of all humankind from one pair, Adam and Eve? Nowadays, anthropologists believe that to widen the population, it would take more than two people, but rather hundreds to 10,000 of them. Otherwise, their descendants risk degenerating due to close kinship, or they would have to use genetic engineering to subtly correct their DNA. Now that I think about it, there's a famous episode in the book of Genesis when all humankind, and even animals, were on the verge of extinction, but were saved only thanks to an ambitious engineering project. Some researchers believe that Noah's Ark is absolutely real. In fact, it's already been found. 
The book of Genesis directly indicates the place where the giant ship finally stopped, the mountains of Ararat. Most Bible scholars agree we're talking about the highest peak in Turkey, Mount Agri, more than 5,000 meters high. It's in this region that, since the 7th century BC, all sorts of expeditions have been sent in search of Noah's Ark, mainly at the expense of the church, and almost all of them returned not empty-handed, but with a plank or other wooden fragment that supposedly belonged to the legendary ship. However, given that many church artifacts like relics of saints turned out to be faked, there's no reason to trust these testimonies. A much more exciting thing is what was unexpectedly discovered on Mount Agri, that is, Ararat, in the 20th century. In the fall of 1946, Life magazine published a sensational photo of a huge boat-shaped formation in the natural terrain on the slope of Ararat. This picture impressed many believers, but no one took it as seriously as anesthetist Ron Wyatt from Tennessee. He was determined to prove those were indeed the remains of Noah's Ark. Arriving at the site in the late 70s, Wyatt saw that this unusual rock had a series of symmetrical structures very similar to the beams of the sides and decks. Moreover, this boat-like hill slung over a limestone ledge like a ship hitting an obstacle. But how did it get there? Wyatt assumed that powerful mud flows had once swept through this valley, so he went upstream. What was his surprise when a couple of kilometers away, he found a stone with the same boat-like shape inscribed on it, and in it, there were eight faces, apparently corresponding to Noah, his three sons, and their four wives. And you know what? Not only fragments of wooden structures were found very nearby on the slope, but also strange metal artifacts composed of a mixture of magnesium, titanium, and aluminum. The fact that it's a completely unnatural combination was later confirmed by geophysicist John Baumgartner. Wyatt's discovery interested him so much that he went to Ararat with high-frequency metal scanners and studied the boat-like structure with them. The results stunned even people who already believed they had found the Ark. Right beneath their feet, there were parallel metallic structures not typical for natural ores. The researchers assumed those were nothing more than rows of rivets in the beams of a giant ship. But why did the Ark's remains end up in two different places? Wyatt's theory says that after the waters receded, the vessel settled higher up on the slope, where its lower decks were firmly stuck in the silt. However, a few hundred years later, a volcano erupted nearby, triggering mudslides. They literally cut off the upper part of the arc and carried it downward, where it struck a limestone rock. As a result, the thick slurry of mud and rocks preserved the wooden structures, gradually turning them into common fossils while the metal rivets remained intact. Though the most interesting thing is that by measuring the length of both structures below and above the slope, the researchers obtained very similar values from 137 to 157 meters, and the largest of them exactly corresponds to 300 Egyptian cubits. According to the book of Genesis, that was the length of Noah's Ark. These discoveries impressed the Turkish authorities so much that they sent their own expedition to the alleged Ark and even decided to open a national park there dedicated to Noah's Ark. Subsequent, more modern scans of the area have shown that the mountainside does contain a volumetric ship-like structure. However, despite all this evidence, most archaeologists and geologists believe we're facing a natural formation. It's just extremely anomalous. The main argument of skeptical scientists is that the accurately measured age of these rocks of 4,800 years doesn't correspond to any known natural cataclysm in this area. And given the markings of the boat and the faces on the stone, it's much more likely that Wyatt found not Noah's Ark higher up the slope, but only a sanctuary erected on Ararat 
by people who revered the myth of Noah's Ark. Finally, the size of the supposed ancient vessel makes it almost longer than the longest wooden ship in history, the schooner Wyoming. Could craftsmen thousands of years ago have surpassed the technological level of the American shipyard of the early 20th century? And even if they had succeeded in assembling such a monster, could it have sailed during the terrible Great Flood? To find the truth, we'll have to delve into the history of biblical mega-projects. The Book of Genesis describes another giant structure archaeologists have searched for for centuries, the Tower of Babel. And the text even mentions its building materials, bricks for stone and bitumen for mortar. They were used to build all the buildings in ancient Babylon, yet houses and temples were one thing. Whereas a giant tower that had to reach all the way to heaven was on another level. What height could it be? Today, the boundary of space, or more like the threshold of heaven, is considered the Karman Line at an altitude of 100 kilometers. But the current tallest building in the world, the Burj Khalifa skyscraper, is only 828 meters high. In other words, we couldn't reach even 1% of this altitude using the most advanced technology and heavy-duty concrete. Are bricks and bitumen any better? The Chrysler Building in New York City is in fact the tallest brick tower in the world. Its peak reaches 320 meters, which is almost three times lower than the Burj Khalifa. The only thing is that the whole structure here is supported not by bricks, but by a steel frame. If you suddenly took it away, the Chrysler Building would immediately collapse under its own weight. According to the engineer's most optimistic calculations, the tower made of typical Babylonian bricks bonded with bitumen mortar couldn't have been higher than 20 meters, or it would have collapsed under its own weight. What kind of heaven is that if it's barely three floors high? Yet archaeological evidence claims that the Babylonians could bypass this limitation and build a colossal ancient skyscraper. This is all that remains of the Atemanaki Ziggurat, literally translated from Sumerian as House of the Foundation of Heaven and Earth. It was supposedly constructed about 4,000 years ago, but was later destroyed and reconstructed many times. The ancient Jews, together with the Book of Genesis authors, might have observed all of that. British Babylonian professor Andrew George concluded from excavation data that the ziggurat of Etemenanki looked something like this. It looks more like the Tower of Babel, doesn't it? The architects outdid themselves by using bricks fired at different temperatures to combine a kind of skeleton and increase its strength. These tricks made it possible for the majestic ziggurat to reach a height of 91 meters. This is only a quarter of the height of the Great Pyramid in Egypt, assembled from solid blocks of granite. For most people in Babylon a few thousand years ago, the Atemenanki ziggurat was the largest building they'd ever seen. Given the flat terrain around them, it might indeed have seemed like the Tower of Babel reached the heavens themselves. Such a mega-project obviously required enormous organizational skills and human resources. So if the Babylonian kingdom could afford such luxury, what about humble and righteous Noah with his ark? If we fully trust the words of the book of Genesis, it's the Lord who created the ark. Besides, God also gave Noah the exact parameters of the ship, 300 by 50 by 30 cubits, and even named the main building material, gopher wood. But if the size can be easily translated into modern values, scientists and theologians are still arguing about the translation of the name of the wood. Most likely, it was either pine or cedar or cypress. Either way, Noah would have needed an awful lot of wood for the colossal ark. This was very well felt by the creators of a modern-day replica of Noah's ark in Kentucky. To meet the biblical parameters exactly, they ordered a total of more than 10,000 cubic meters of wood. It doesn't sound very impressive, does it? But it's actually around 20 and a half thousand 10-meter-tall trees. That's essentially an entire forest. 
However, to avoid harming nature, the Ark's creators took only already outdated spruces. To process all this volume and melt the parts, a modern workshop from Colorado needed 25 people working around the clock in three shifts, six days a week, for an entire year. Overall, the Noah's Ark replica was constructed in a year and a half with the help of at least a thousand people. But the book of Genesis doesn't mention that Noah was helped by anyone other than his family, the same eight people, half of whom were women. But if we even imagine that God gave them not only the blueprints, but also woodworking machinery similar to modern woodworking, then based on the pace of construction of the replica in Kentucky, Noah would have needed about 450 years of uninterrupted work. And the most interesting thing is that he had them. After all, according to the book of Genesis, Noah, as one of the pre-flood patriarchs, lived a full 950 years. But we must remember that his divine deadline for building the ark was much stricter. Noah received the flood warning only 120 years before it began. That means, even according to biblical logic, he must have had at least one or two hundred helpers. For about a century, they would have harvested the wood and cut out the parts and assembled the ark in the last 20 years so that the wooden structure wouldn't have had time to rot away right on the site. But if we take all factors into account and at least try to come close to a realistic estimate with the participation of the same thousand people as in Kentucky, but without modern tools, Noah could well do it within half a century. However, in this case, his biblical image of a hermit, laughed at and disbelieved by everyone, is shattered. To pull off the mega project with the ark, the real Noah had to be a wealthy and popular person with excellent organizational skills. But even after all the titanic labors under his leadership, the weary and aging workers would wonder if the ship would float when the apocalypse started. Could the Great Flood have sunk Noah's Ark with all of its passengers? According to the book of Genesis, water covered the entire land, including the peaks of the highest mountains. However, a fairly simple calculation shows that such a flood would require at least two more world oceans to be poured onto Earth in 40 days and 40 nights. This is like the Great Waterfall. So, today, scientists are sure that the book of Genesis describes a large-scale but localized flood. Analysis of the stones in that same ancient Mesopotamia show that the Tigris and Euphrates rivers regularly overflowed for many kilometers around. It's estimated by archaeologists that the most catastrophic of them could flood areas within a radius of 160 to 320 kilometers, and the maximum corresponds to just simultaneous heavy rains. This flood swept underwater all the region's major cities, along with all the highlands, so that a local who miraculously escaped by boat would not see any land around them. Indeed, the whole world known to them was flooded. And this Mesopotamian flood happened about 4,900 years ago, which almost coincides with the assumed age of the anomalous rocks on Mount Ararat. But would Noah's Ark have sailed anywhere at all? In Kentucky, they built not a ship, but an ark-shaped recreation center for Christians. Its builders didn't even try to calculate its buoyancy. Instead, physics students from the University of Leicester did it. They took the average parameters of Noah's Ark, 144 by 24 by 14 and a half meters, a little smaller than the Kentucky replica, but quite consistent with the mysterious structures on Ararat. The main material chosen was cypress, which has an average weight between cedar and pine. Initially, most of the students were sure that the calculations would show the complete invalidity of the biblical legend. But to their surprise, Noah's Ark, with these parameters, thanks to the expulsive force of Archimedes, floated easily. Moreover, it could take on board more than two million sheep without any risk of sinking. This, according to biologist calculations, is more than enough to take a couple or even more representatives of 35,000 animal species. However, buoyancy does not guarantee survival in a real flood. If Noah had built his ark directly on a plane, 
it would have been surely turned upside down by powerful tidal waves. After all, even modern ships get tossed around like toys when they're hit by tsunamis and ports. Noah, therefore, should have built the ark on an elevated site so that the water would come gradually to the sides. But even this is not enough. Over decades of construction, the bottom of the ship would have stuck firmly in the ground, and even the power of Archimedes would not have helped. The ark would have turned into an aquarium. Still, an engineering solution exists. The ark must be assembled on a pedestal of transverse stone walls. When the water arrives, it'll simply pick up the vessel from them without the risk of being turned upside down. Waves are another matter. Numerous modern tankers made of the strongest steel have snapped like matches in a storm. To prevent the giant wooden vessel from going through the same fate, Noah had to use one of several know-hows when assembling the hull to give it sufficient strength. Rivets alone wouldn't have been enough. He had to think hard about the shape of the wooden parts and the way they were fastened. Needless to say, these engineering technologies were unknown in antiquity and appeared only at the beginning of the 20th century. Nevertheless, even if the ark, vulnerable to the waves, had miraculously stayed afloat, the final blow to the realism of this story is not even physics, but geography. It's not even the distance between Mesopotamia and Ararat, which is about one and a half thousand kilometers. The thing is that the giant boat-like structure was found at an altitude of about 2,000 meters, which is a hundred times higher than the level of Mesopotamia's worst real flood. So can we really forget about the findings on the slopes of Ararat in the biblical legend for good? Not so fast. You see, Noah's Ark didn't have to float to be real. If Noah somehow foresaw a global flood, he would have immediately tried to move as high up as possible. And it's hard to find a higher and closer peak to Mesopotamia than Ararat. Noah likely told everyone he knew about the coming catastrophe and convinced enough people to follow him. Thus, not just Noah's family went to Ararat, but also potentially hundreds of his faithful followers. They climbed the known slope, and according to Noah's instructions, they all began to build the ark because, from their point of view, the water might have reached there too. Then it doesn't matter what kind of wood and technology they used because the flood was limited to Mesopotamia and didn't even come to the foot of Mount Ararat. However, the enormous wooden ark was ready and became something like a temple. Just imagine, a traveler climbs a mountain and sees a giant vessel. What story would they tell when they returned home? Exactly. They would tell about such a terrible flood that the ark from Mesopotamia was swept up to Ararat. Would you believe in such a theory?